before we go into this, <clears throat> I want to make one thing clear. If Mike's volume seems weird, that is because he's having microphone issues. I try to rectify as much as possible, but here's the situation as a whole. As I, as I point out here. <clears throat> Let's just clear this up. And when I can play out the audio, I really can't do little about that. As I said here, I do not have a premium account for editing. I cannot alter individual segments. I cannot alter peaks or rises of segments. That also means background noise I can't really deal with or get rid of. I'm hoping and reliant on the people I'm working with to be competent. I know how to be competent myself, but others are not always so. My point overall here is that I cannot ensure all time some things, but I will manage the best as I can between things. As I said here, as I was saying in this section here, I can block things up, which is why which, which is what I did here. That way I can alter the individual sections of things to help this predicament. And I do hope people understand this and don't judge it straight away. If anything, the resources is good enough. So you should not dislike. Either way, with that, I will go ahead with the episode. Enjoy. So, on the topic of arguments for or against religion, Mike, what do you think then is uh, one of the best or worst arguments in your opinion? Um, I guess the worst opinion that you could have against religion is when presented with evidence, a lot of it is based on seeing is believing, except that if you actually look at the standards the Bible uses to judge people, it's actually by the inside. So we walk by faith, not necessarily by outward appearance. So you actually need to know what someone is thinking to really understand what the argument is, not so much physical evidence. Don't get me wrong, physical evidence is important, but it's so important to people's experiences. I guess faith is kind of like an experience. And testimony, I guess there's an important part I wanted to say is that when you're judging someone's testimony, what a lot of people tend to do is when they're trying to look for evidence, there's like there's stunning Kruger effect, which is to say that people are going to be looking for evidence that confirms their worldview. When in fact, in regards to testimony, you can't believe the first person that talks to you about something. You need to talk to different people and then make a judgment, objectively speaking, what is the truth. Right. Uh, cool. Uh, cool. Cool. That's an insight. Because today I have, I'll be addressing one atheistic point, which I kind of agree and disagree with. And that is the Celestial North Korea example. Do you, are you knowledgeable of it? Uh, you should be knowledgeable of it. You should know it because I did send the clip to you to at least understand before going into it. Um, so... Let's go into it, shall we? Let's do it. Some people I know who are atheists will say they wish they could believe it. Some people I know who are former believers say they wish they could have their old faith back. They miss it. I don't understand this at all. I think it's, a, it's, it's an excellent thing that there's no reason to believe in the absurd propositions I just uh, admittedly rather briefly rehearsed to you. That is one aspect I do agree with him on. There's no reason to necessarily believe in that. But that's not the point. I'm saying, this as, and this will be very problematic later, and when Sam sorts, gets more online and isn't walking his dog, he can contribute to this, but we can go over this now. I will continue anyway. Okay, okay. Um, the main reason for this, I think, is that it is a totalitarian belief. It is the wish to be a slave. It is the desire. That's the thing is, though, 
the wish to be a slave thing isn't that far off reality in some cases of in what I notice from people. For some, they unironically do have a slave mentality when it comes down to religion. Because I actually have encountered unironically people who think there's no purpose, they their life has no purpose without if God does not exist, and which is a slave mentality. Yeah, it's also quite. I, I'm sorry, it's existentialist almost. Um, when you say that you do need God to exist, because a lot of these people would be nihilist. So actually, they're trying to inject a sense of purpose in their lives, which is a net positive. Uh, that being said, I guess I think everyone, for the most part, has a slave mentality in the sense that they do serve something or someone. It just depends what they serve or who they serve. And I okay. think, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Let's let's actually continue with the video. Let's not linger these out for too long. I'll, I'm just breaking it up just so copyright can't attack me to death, that's all. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, that there be an unalterable, unchallengeable, tyrannical authority who can convict you of thought crime while you are asleep, who can, can, who can subject you, who must indeed subject you, to a total surveillance around the clock Every waking and sleeping minute of your life, I say of your life, before you're born, and even worse, and where the real fun begins, after you're dead. And, and again, this is where I say, this is somewhat line of argumentation I do partially agree with, in that death should be a, a way of actually getting release and autonomy. But that's a, the point I'm saying this isn't because he manages, manages this argument well. He uses a very, very bad intention with this. Hmm. Definitely persuasive in his rhetoric. He's evident what he's trying to achieve here with his agenda. A celestial North Korea. <laughs> Who wants this to be true? Who but a slave desires such a ghastly fate? I've been to North Korea. It has a dead man as its president, Kim Jong-il, is... Actually, the funny thing about that is, is that when you say president, uh, Kim Jong-il, it's actually more simple, more simple than that. Because when they say president, president was only really a case only for a single time under Kim Jong-il. President never really exists as a title afterwards, necessarily. Because the whole aim was for a united Korea. So this is where... it it This is where, for example, Hitchens, I think, misses the point entirely. Thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, we've heard it all before. Like, North Korea is a work of utopia. I don't think, genuinely speaking, people actually live in North Korea believe that. Uh, which is something he gets, uh, um, he alludes to later on in this video. Only head of the party and head of the army, he's not head of the government or the state. That office belongs to his deceased father, Kim Il sung. But that, again, though, sorry to cut again, but it's an only position, it's not necessarily a physical position. They aren't, they aren't saying Kim Jong il can manifest. And give you and give you power and promises. That's the difference. It's the honorary position because Kim Jong Il was a respectful and key figure in terms of the history of the country. Therefore, he gets a good honorary status. It's that simple. Yeah, a lot of the time when they mention stuff like this, they don't actually understand the symbolic or spiritual meaning of these titles and they're doing this basically for shock value because North Korea is easy targets, easy fruit to pick up. <laughs> and and that's why and that's why this argument fails. Is the logic of the argument bad? Not necessarily. But is the example bad? Most definitely. The example is what he thinks is a is a got you card. But it really isn't a got you moment. The got you moment ultimately is that, the, and this is where, in some aspects, 
stuff like this should stay clear from politics if it's not necessary. Um, and don't worry. Um, if you think I'm, if you think I'm just being unfair here, don't worry. I found a good thing from the Catholic Church from around around the Industrial Revolution, which also condemns them as well for this sort of crime. <laughs> so don't worry. My point is, is that this whole narrative is just badly done. I'll continue. It's a necrocracy. A thanatocracy is one short of a trinity, I might add. The Son is the reincarnation of the Father. It is the most revolting and utter and absolute and heartless tyranny the human species has ever evolved. But at least... Incorrect. Um, that's very... That's incorrect. As, as, we, as we went over. The thing of the Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un is... Is that Kim Jong Il, as I've mentioned, is this, is the symbolic leader of the nation because he was the first to lead the DPRK into the future. It's that simple, and it's stuff like this where people misunderstand politics and bring in theism or atheism into it that ruins it. Yeah, I think um, Hitchens is actually a good example of someone who puts their faith or lack of faith ahead of politics. I mean, or you could say the other way around, really, because he's almost, it's a dunning trigger effect, because he's looked at the example of North Korea, and he's essentially said, okay, how can I best twist this to suit my worldview? And that's the, and that's the funny thing, right? That's the same crime a lot of apologists commit as well. <laughs> I mean, everyone has to make a decision, I guess, as life goes on and in their life personally. Are they going to put their faith ahead of politics or their politics ahead of faith? And generally speaking, you'll find that the more hardcore believers tend to put their faith above their politics. And in my ca- and, and in my case, as you know, I put politics before faith or mm. lack of faith in my in this situation, um, yeah. where. Where yes, I am a atheist and slightly and a slight anti theist. That that doesn't that at the same time that that does not define me as a character. I don't do things just to justify atheism or anti theism. I do things if something's atheistic or anti theistic. Cool. I don't try and impose value on it. And I mean, someone's ideology and um, worldview, they kind of connect to one another and it's like what relationship do they have is it that the worldview based on faith determines the ideology is the ideology based on the worldview and a lot of these questions it, it generally speaks to the motive force of somebody within um dialectical materialism or in within the faith the, the state of their heart I guess it's synonymous with one another in this case. On this point, though, on this, on this point, though, I do have a source addressing this, which I will get to next. I know it's skipping, and it, and it's like I would cover later, but due to Sam being late, that's I'll skip ahead to it because it's relevant okay. and a way for him to come back. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, continuing. East, you can fucking die and leave North Korea. Does the Quran, does the Quran or the Bible offer you that liberty? No. No. The tyranny, the misery, the utter ownership of your entire personality, the smashing of your individuality only begins at the point of death. And this is where I say, again, it's a bad, it's a bad example, good argument. Because I do personally agree that an afterlife, afterlife, in terms of the biblical sense, would be horrible. And yes, I do agree with that. But this is a thing, as you said. This is a case where Hitch, uh, Hitchens did not apply proper political analysis to this to the, his case. He's talking about is this point fine? Yes. The whole point about tyranny in the afterlife and your own autonomy being stripped is fine to say 
it's just a case of it's just a case that well yeah his examples is shit <laughs> Yeah, I think I'll just answer this point and then we'll move on. Um, about the fact of the afterlife, it kind of depends because the truth of the matter is that God offers us peace, as in with through the gospel. Like he basically gives us choice. This is my this is my belief. And it's interesting because it either saves people or makes them hard and stubborn, two different choices basically. But yet this hardness and stubbornness is of their own free will, for he never forces anyone to respond in faith. So the truth of the matter with the afterlife is that you actually make the decision whether you want to experience it or not, the fullness of it, that is. And that will lead into the orthodox, orthodox explanation of what heaven and hell actually are. Uh, which is foremostly an experience above all else. Okay, okay. Uh, do you want to cover the... Do you want, do you want to cover the, my commentary on on... Will, will this mean the opinion of the masses? Uh, because there's been there's something I found on that which is good. Or do you want to cover the orthodox heaven next? Which one? Which one? Uh, uh, Marx. Uh, uh, yeah. Which one? Marx or orthodox? Orthodox. orthodox? Yeah. yeah. Fine, fine, fine. That's fine. I'll finish this and get to your source. Okay. This is evil. This is a wicked preachman. So that's the first thing. <laughs> okay. It's done. Okay. I'll go and read the second part, uh, point two, actually. Um, okay. I, I might, I might, I might, I remember be as clear as possible. And yes, I can't do much with your mic situation, but still be as clear as possible. Okay. Okay. So paradise and hell are not two different places. This version is an idolatrous concept. They signify two different situations which originate from the same uncreated source and are perceived by man as two different experiences. Or more precisely, they are the same experience, except they are perceived differently by man, depending on man's internal state, aka the state of his heart. This experience is the sight of Christ inside the uncreated light of his divinity, of his glory. From the moment of his second coming on Judgment Day, through to all eternity, all people will be seeing Christ. That is when those who work good deeds in their lifetime will go towards the resurrection of their life, while those who work evil in their lifetime will go towards the resurrection of judgment. In the presence of Christ, mankind will be separated, sheep and goats, to his right and his left. In other words, they will be discerned in two separate groups. Those who will be looking upon Christ as paradise, the exceeding good, the radiant, and those who will be looking upon Christ as hell. The all consuming fire, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. And interestingly enough, that's actually one meaning of the name God is burning, is a consuming flame, according to the same Bible verse. He burns up sin and corruption in the repentance, he cleanses them with his purifying fire, and likewise, he consumes the wicked. Paradise and hell are the same reality. This is what is depicted in the portrayal of the second coming. From Christ, the river flows forth. It is radiant like a golden light at the upper end of it where the saints are. At the lower end, the same river is fiery, and it is in that part of the river that the demons and the unrepentant are depicted. That is why in the Gospel of Luke, we read that Christ stands as the fallen resurrection of men. Christ becomes the resurrection into eternal life, for those who accepted him and who followed the suggested means of healing the heart, and those who rejected him, he becomes a demise in their health. And that is why free will is so important, because I, what I wanted to bring specific attention to is upon those who look upon Christ as hell. And the truth of the matter is that God didn't actually create hell for sinners. He done so for the fallen angels, for the demons. I'll say one more thing. I think this has actually completely changed my mind, even as someone who was baptized in the faith as a child, because I've always thought of paradise and hell as two different places. And only now have I actually come across the truth. 
And I find that interesting what Hitchin said. I'll just relate this argument to what um, Christopher was saying in the previous video. Uh, I'm, 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 Mike. Uh, 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 sure, uh, sure, that's fine. You can reply that. I just want to add one thing before we do. Um, for me, even when I was in the Catholic Church, I ne I still, I never believed in heaven or I never believed in hell, even when I was in the Catholic Church. So for me, hell always was a fictional thing, because in my in my family, that in my family, no one, even even the religious, even the religious people in my family never believed in hell. So for me, I find the concept of hell very bizarre. And that's why for me, there, that's why for me, there was no real weird issues leaving religion because I never had a belief in hell. <laughs> anyway, back to your point about the comments. Yeah. yeah, could I actually ask you um, in, in regards to not believing in hell, that, that this actually comes, well, this is not so much a question, also a bit of a statement. I think that comes from a universalist argument that there is no hell, that essentially if you have faith, you are safe. That, that's the argument why there is no hell. It's a universalist argument. I, I mean universalist not in the terms of morality, but in terms of the religion of universalist Christianity. That being said, I'll say that the idea of hell as in someone could simply end I don't really believe in it. I don't believe that people merely end their existence after they die. And there's different reasons for this. Um, and it's the, the, the different reasons is that, for instance, they live on in spirit and consciousness. Why do they live in spirit and consciousness? Because people remember them. They remember their work. And I guess why here it's so important is that people are judged according to their work. Those who work evil in their lifetime will go towards the resurrection of judgment. And that's really important because essentially what we get remembered by what we do. What we do is remembered for all eternity. So I find what Hitchin said to be rather interesting. How he said that the afterlife is automatically hell. Not necessarily. I guess it depends that it depends on someone's faith, which in turn produces good work. But that's actually how someone is saved. It's by faith that produces good work. It's not the Catholic sense of salvation that the person say. It's a, it's a straw man, basically, that it's only dependent on what you do. It's only dependent on your faith. It's actually a combination of the two. Okay. So I'm not really sure that he thinks is right when he says that the afterlife is automatically held. So it isn't necessarily so. Depending okay. On what people do. Mike, let me explain. I do understand this rationale, actually. That that's why I said it's a decent example, but terrible in reality, but terrible justification. Okay. You don't understand. There are some sects, and this is probably just a case that his sect he was under did promote the idea of a heaven and hell distinction i haven't looked that much into his woods his background but i do know that some do have a distinction that heaven and hell are two distinct places mm. where fear of hell is used to keep people in under control and to basically guilt people into submission uh, i mean i don't i don't disagree with that and i think it's actually a decent motivator for people to do good work now, if it's a preferred method of getting people to do good work, no, it isn't. But it's sort of a segue Mike, to doing better things. Mike, and the point, uh, and my point here is to say, is that okay? Let's explain why the concept of heaven is hell. Heaven, as described by idealism within Christianity, is hell to atheists. You need to understand that, right? Do you understand that concept? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you choose exactly um, how you're going to experience the afterlife is what the source is saying. So, I mean, I don't disagree with what you're saying either. My point, uh, and also there's another factor here, is that there's no actual proof of an afterlife. It's always in the spiritual vagueness. And, for example, even the Bible itself, 
about death, right? I, f- I forgot which version it's, it's in, but or which first because I because I'm not, I'm not I don't really really read really, really the Bible much anymore. But I do remember the one clarification of the Bible at least um, that it said after death your body stays, but your soul goes to heaven. But that's where the whole issue is. The the soul going that, that and that's where the distinction is, I guess. The soul itself does not really exist necessarily, so that whole narrative does not exist. Do you see where it comes from? Okay, we don't have much in the way of time, but we'll conclude this argument. I'm just interested in regards to that idea of evidence in the afterlife because we rely on other people's testimony because essentially most people haven't come back from the dead. Most people haven't come back from the dead. But those who have had near death experiences, they Two seconds. Yeah, no. Uh, I'll just, um, two seconds. No, no, it's okay. Um, I just meant to say that in regards to the evidence of an afterlife, it's obviously going to be difficult to prove unless you have that belief in the first place, and I understand that. However, what I've seen is that a few people have had near-death experiences, and while not everyone who has a near-death experience experiences the same movement of soul from their body, there tends to be some similarities. So there is corroboration of evidence in this regard. And I think the background of every person is also one way to be uh, make an objective decision on whether this evidence can be accepted. And a lot of times, these people who have near-death experiences, they aren't believers. Yet they do tend to see similar experiences, regardless of their belief existing beforehand. So we can eliminate bias from the equation. And they tend to say that hell is a place with lots of sulfur. It's a really disgusting smell, place of darkness. And I find it interesting that these kind of depictions can be in the hearts of a disbeliever, essentially. And likewise, how heaven is a place of light. They, they see a tunnel of light when they come back to reality, to physical reality, that is. So for me... There is evidence of an afterlife in terms of testimony if we're looking at the entire collection of testimonies more often than not. But sometimes, of course, people don't actually believe in it, so they don't actually see it. Which is an interesting um, statement on the faith that people who don't believe aren't going to see. Do some rapid fire stuff in the meantime. Just need to just make sure I click this. Yes, I have. We'd expect to find two types of atheists among our experiments participants. Type 1, those who have been calling themselves atheists for a shorter amount of time and are shown to be lying when asked about their beliefs. And type... Uh, for example, this is the lie, lie detector stuff, if anyone doesn't know. Hmm. 2, those who have been calling themselves atheists for a longer amount of time and pass the polygraph test because God has given them over to genuine disbelief. If we didn't find that those who'd been atheists for longer were more likely to pass the polygraph, or that all participants passed the polygraph, though, Turek could say that human timescales mean nothing to God, and that he may give up atheists early on as well. He could also say that suppressing the truth in unrighteousness is a spiritual process, not a psychological one, so any lie-detecting measure we use couldn't detect this. The point is, no matter how much we test Turek's hypothesis of atheist psychology, Turek could explain away any of our findings inconsistent with his hypothesis by invoking God or the Spirit. An undetectable, unpredictable, all-powerful force like God, we'd expect to find two. Okay, um, I will say this. I will say that at the end of the day, it's up to people like that to make the decision with their own free will. And the truth of the matter is that when some people like become entrenched in their beliefs. It's almost entirely on them. I don't think... Once the the peace offering has been made for people to really renounce their prior transgressions, well, that's about it, isn't it? 
the one time offer. It's lasting for life. Okay. Uh Okay, next one. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world... Three seconds. World, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so people are without excuse. Here's Turek's answer to the question. I think that there are some people out there who genuinely don't believe God exists because they've suppressed the truth so long that God has given up to their own. Anyway, for clarity, clarity, just so people understand, it's a balanced thing going on here. I don't believe in Tarek or what the claim of Tarek is saying. Suppressing the truth, I think, is a complete farce. Uh, because at the end of the day, the issue ultimately lies in the fact that there's the truth they're using in terms of Christian context is not really provable by many means. So it's like invalid, but either way, I'll continue desires and they're at the end of Romans 1 rather than the beginning. So I don't want to call people who are atheists disingenuous. They may be totally honest, but they've lost the capacity to recognize God exists because God knows they're never coming back and he has given them up. And to be honest, I find, and as a result, I find this a line of argumentation insulting. Actually, to be honest, there is truth in what they're saying, but it's understood differently than a literal examination of the context because in the old testament it says that god hardened pharaoh's heart but really he didn't actually move his heart per se it was pharaoh's fault he actually allowed pharaoh to make that decision so i think what they're trying to say here is that it's up to everyone to actually make the decision and in some regard once you denied the gospel it is going to be an entrenched belief because it's sort of like an all or nothing proposition in regards to what the commandments say because in regards to the commandments if you've import something you necessarily have to do it correct otherwise you're basically betraying the message of that people i still think uh, though i yes, go on. I, I still think though this whole line this whole line by tulik is very destructive as a whole because this is the thing his line he's saying here will ultimately be used can have potential to be used to ultimately dismiss and ultimately put down people because maybe maybe depends if you take it personally i mean i wouldn't personally take it like that like saying that someone is stubborn or entrenched in their disbelief because really it's an all-or-nothing proposition, so it's not really... Um, going forward from this, Sam did turn up, and we had a general discussion surrounding the DPRK, which is the official name for North Korea. And after this, we had a more entrenched discussion around the topic surrounding... Who has the responsibility to justify their claims? Okay, I briefly went over the the celestial North Korea career argumentation. Uh, so yeah. let me get let me get cut off two, for two seconds, and you two and Mike and Sam can talk about uh about the celestial North Korea example for for now. No, Sam, I heard you went to North Korea. How was it? Who do you want me to go first, me or Mike? Does not matter. Well, I just want to make sure I get this order right because you're recording it. You don't want us to speak over each other, so I want to make sure that we get it all recorded pretty properly, that's all. Uh, uh, fine. In this case, Sam, you can go first. Well, I went to North Korea in 2014 and... 
Ray Ferguson, the guy I was drunk with, made a joke about me having to go to church, and he said, and, and my guide in North Korea, Mrs. Kim, told me that was fine. The DPRK does allow religious freedom. They are allowed Christianity, Buddhism, and there's another religion they have, which is idol worship. I think there's something else they call it all. But they do allow religious freedom in the DPRK. However, it's restricted to the churches, the, the ideology of the churches are allowed. And so it's actually a common misconception that church is unallowed. I did my research on this young pioneer tours and other companies that actually are from Britain who go to the DPRK. I've actually been used to say, yes, there are, you are allowed to go and attend church and there is religious freedom in the DPRK. It's a total misnomer of this celestial North Korea thing that's been used by atheists to try to discredit communism, and it's actually not true at all because religious freedom is allowed in the GPRK. Um, uh, correction, uh, correction. It's being used by atheists and theists alike to discredit the DPRK. Just a clarification. Mm. It's just for clarification, just to make sure it's accurate at all. <laughs> uh, uh, right. Which what? Okay. Which source do you want to use first? Do you want to use the Young Pioneers tours or the Rocky Road tours? Well, I'll use the Young Pioneer tours because they're a very credible source and actually they have been used by uh, quite a lot. And they're actually a British tour company that also goes to Transnistria and quite a lot of other countries. They're very credible. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Alden, uh, I'll then read some stuff from the Young Pioneer's website, then shall I? Yes, Okay, good, good, good. Um, can you go to to go? Can you go to church in North Korea? This is by Young Pioneers Tours. What date? Um, date, date, date. Oh, date doesn't matter. It's recently opened the borders back up, so it might have been before the pandemic. Or... Um, okay. Either way, though, does not matter. Um, it's still valid. Um, join my first, uh, Sam, TV off, please. Okay, certainly. I'll turn that off now, certainly. I'll turn this off. Okay, certainly. There you go. Good. Okay, right on your That's fine. Um, that's fine. Um, during my first ever visit to North Korea as a tour tourist back in 2012, my group was mostly Christians who were specifically organised through Youth Pioneers Tours. Our first day on Pyongyang fell on Sunday, so the group requested to be part of a church service at... How do you, how do you pronounce this? C-H-I-L-G-O-L? How do you that? How do you pronounce that? Shilgol. Hmm? Shilgol. Shilgol. Right. As a bus pulled up, I noticed four other foreigners making their way into the church. I was able to talk to one of them. As he said... He said he and family were tourists visiting a brother, a man working at embassy in Pyongyang. My group and I were unshedded, uh, were, were ushered, were ushered in, as we, we took our seats in. Uh, every person was given Bible in both English and Korean. One on the left, as uh, one on the left who sat. The foreigners and one right to set the local Koreans. And a North Korean priest took the stage and began, began his sermon. Everything was Korean, so, so it was hard for me to stay focused. And my mind wandered. I saw Koreans to the right of me keeping eyes glued to the Bible in front of them. The Christians in my group also seemed to struggle to focus. But they were very respectful of the priest's sermon despite not understanding it. The sermon conducted after around half an hour. And everyone stood up to sing Korean hymns. The church had its own local choir. The whole service took over took over a little over an hour. Everyone made their way out of church and said goodbye. The Christian group said they thoroughly enjoyed it and looked back at it. It was certainly a very unique ceremony to watch. 
If you'd like to participate in church service, you can arrange this from uh for you on an independent tour to North Korea. Okay. Mike. Commentary? I gotta say something which is that whenever I'm talking about North Korea be, being a kind of heaven, actually in terms of sheer politics only, not so much about the faith, for me it actually is one of the better places politically in the world. And the reason for this is the reason why I'm gonna inject politics is that unless you're a liberal first positionist, North Korea is essentially one of the best places in the world if you're second positionist, third positionist, and fourth positionist politically. Um, but in terms of getting back to the subject of faith, it definitely does warm my heart to see that there can be some faith within North Korea. Now, a lot of people would ask, what's the point of having a church in North Korea if most of the people there legitimately are atheists or agnostic? And the truth of the matter is that the importance of the church in North Korea can't be misunderstood because the fact of the matter is that they actually do allow for some freedom of religion, which is important because a lot of the so-called human rights abuses in North Korea are to do with a lack of freedom for the native population. And I guess what gives me more confidence in the North Korean example of treating faith, even though it's not necessarily a big thing within their culture, is the fact that within that article, specifically they mentioned, which a lot of people are going to be asking about this, they're going to be asking, are there local North Koreans going to church? And yes, that church in particular is Russian Orthodox. Uh, uh, Sam, the, uh, I'm, yeah. I, I'm, I might, might, might uh, stop for now. Um, let Sam respond. Sam, respond. Well, so the ideologies are, well, of the human rights violations that have been so-called talked about by defectors who essentially have been paid off by the United States to go to South Korea and essentially the ideology of religious freedom that they try to say that they, their suppression of by the DPRK has mostly been paid off by the US. They pay millions of dollars for people to defect. However, the fact is that Judge Kirby, who was an Australian High Court judge, who said about the crimes of the DPRK and the human rights violations, talked to North Korean defectors in New York and Paris. He never actually went to China and he never went to Pyongyang. And they're the only ways in and out of the DPRK. So the illegitimacy of these human rights violations that so coldly were committed were actually nothing more than US propaganda. And actually, most North Koreans who defect to South Korea find themselves ostracized in South Korean society due to the fact that they do not support to support them and they are treated with a large amount of suspicion. And they are actually considered to be outcasts in North Korean society, in South Korean society, when they defect from the North. So it is actually orchestrated by foreign powers to do so. Of course, religion is also used and fascism is also used in that aspect as a weapon against the DPRK in their way of, of, of trying to encourage and support defection from, from Pyongyang and the DPRK. But uh, okay. Um... Okay, okay, okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I, I looked up the constitution of DPRK for a second. Yes. Uh, it says that religion. Turtle, stop it. You're not, no. No, Turtle, you're not climbing up. Don't hurt yourself. <laughs> turtle was wanting to climb up the blanket. <laughs> <laughs> you got, I've been having dog problems. You've got turtle problems. <laughs> As I was saying, as I was saying, uh, Mike can see this anyway. Um, uh, fundamental rights and treaties of citizens, Article Eleven of the uh, of Chapter Two, DPRK Constitution. Um, all citizens of, of DPRK, irrespective of sex, nationality, religious belief, uh, poverty status, or education, have equal rights to. In all spheres of government, political and economic, social, 
it, it, yeah, you get the point. Um, citizens of DPRK have freedom of religious belief and conducting religious ceremonies. It says services, but ceremonies, whatever. Um, all all citizens of DPRK have re who have reached the age of twenty, irrespective of, uh. Um, yeah, yeah, whatever. That that's. It says, all high school leavers after doing have to comply to five years. Of that's just a clarification, clarification, clarification. Come on, give me something more interesting. Um. Yeah. yeah, I'd just like to add here that Article Twelve is quite aggressive in terms of allowing people with religious beliefs to. Um, so uh, uh, just give me two seconds. Let me just bring up and highlight it for everyone. There you go. Yeah, no worries. Article 12 is actually the best part of the constitution in North Korea because, like I said before, most people aren't religious. So it's not necessarily going to be a huge thing within politics there. But the fact of the matter is that the mere fact people can actually apply to be a politician in North Korea, even with their beliefs, is progressive because you can compare it to other examples of state atheism in the past. And I'm not going to say North Korea is a state atheist country. You could say that it's a secular state. Damn. For intents and purposes. Mm. So, Kwasi, you went. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yep. Oh, okay. You want me to, to uh, say about that? Well, actually, they can leave the country, but it's not a problem at all. North Koreans can leave the country. They have to go to the countries that recognize their rights and recognize the DPRK. That's about 120 countries that recognize the DPRK. So their citizens can leave and return anytime they want. They're not, there is a right for them to leave. They are not trapped in and they can go and see Western countries. There's no problems there. They can go to countries that would recognise their passports. However, due to the sanctions put against the GPRK, Australia did not recognise and will not accept GPRK citizens. Only if they are in sporting groups, church organisations, or the Red Cross. Mm, that part point. of the sanctions that Australia and the United States, New Zealand, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, other countries have heavy sanctions on Pyongyang for those reasons. So it does restrict their ability to travel. So they do have the rights to and duties to travel with the other countries. So they're not trapped in the DPRK. They can leave any time they want and return any time they want, providing they have the financial means to support themselves overseas. Um, if I'm quiet, I'm just trying to do a cost analysis between the DPRK constitution and the PRC constitution. If if that if you're wondering why I'm why I'm so quiet. Okay. Yeah, I guess a lot of the problems with human rights in the DPRK would be caused by the sanctions. That's really what's causing their society to stifle in general. So it's a really ironic position to oppose North Korea based on what appears to be human rights abuses, whereas those people who are actually in support of North Korea, sympathetic to the regime, are actually the ones who can do the greatest amount of good. Well, I would, can, I, can I please clarify on that human rights issue? The human rights issue on North Korea is one thing would be the heavy sanctions the West has put on the DPRK that has actually made it harder to get access to materials and petrol. The fact that the sanctions... Internationally, that have been placed on Pyongyang. They have restricted the ability of them to travel and to receive basic materials and others. Don't forget the, the DPRK is the most heavily sanctioned country in the world, or one of the most heavily sanctioned countries. That means they, can't, they have trouble getting access to a lot of equipment and other things that have been, have been able to... You know, they have not been able to receive due to the sanctions. However, they've found ways around them. The human rights issues that you keep bringing up, essentially brought up by Western countries, who talk about human rights on one hand, but are quite happy to sanction the DPRK and then try, and try to go and stop their ability to have economic growth and trade. Uh, wait. Uh, Sam? Sam, Sam, Sam. Okay. Yes. 
I, I noticed this from a 2020, 2020 report for, of International Religious Freedoms, Democratic People's Republic of Korea from the US State Department, but I think it says something in which is fine in it. Uh, and you can correct me if, and you can correct me if this is wrong. Yes, I know. Um, when, when does that legal framework? It says the Constitution states that citizens have freedom of religious belief that is granted through the approval of the Constitution, the constitution of religious buildings and holdings of religious ceremonies. It states further, religious must not be used as a, as a must not be used as a pre-context for drawing in from forces of for harming the state or social order. According to a 2014 official government document, freedom of religion is allowed and, and provided by the state within the limits limit necessary for ensuring social order, health, social security, morality, and yeah. other human rights. The country criminal code punishes a person who, without authorization, imports, makes disputes, or illegally keeps drawings, photographs, books, rec uh, video recordings, or electronic media that reflects decadent, uh, carnal, or foul content. It um, the criminal code also bans engagement in superstitious activities in exchange for, for money or goods. Do you think that's accurate of a description on this topic? Yeah, I think that's an accurate description. But I have to have those laws in place and I have to do that due to the fact that there are defective groups from South Korea who have been trying to, of course... North Korean defectors in South Korea who have tried to carry out also terrorist attacks on the DPRK by trying to blow up communication stations and do other things as well. Uh, before we move into the next North Korea related page, which would be Rocky Road, uh, Mike, any other commentary on this before we move on to the next one? I mean, if your enemy can't really attack you on this point, it definitely corroborates, in my mind at least, that there's evidence that the DPRK is in favor of freedom of religion. And that generally, for the most part, in this regard, nothing can be criticized about their conduct. And actually, I wanted to say one more thing. Um, I think that's actually a really good point, um, how they consulted local sources in regards for cash in exchange for spiritual services, because that is something that happens in North Korea a lot. Um, and you can see that in some of the shows they've made about North Korea. They try to make a more accurate description of what actually how North Korean society and life looks like, and a lot of the time they do consult fortune tellers. And I really wish some of our governments had the common sense to outlaw that here, because for me that's a form of dark magic, personally. And for clarity, that's a case in which uh, is in the DPRK constitution and the PRC constitution. They say it differently. If they say it in slightly different ways, but the principle applies in both. Hmm. I just wonder in that regard, I mean, that's sort of a kind of a catch-all phrase when you say that it's, it's essentially a crime when you exchange services for spiritual services for cash. I wonder if that includes paying money to the priest. I doubt it personally, but I sometimes in those laws that constitutions and governments make, they can definitely open them up for abuse in terms of the interpretation. So it's really important when you're analyzing the law, not just the letter of the law, but its spirit as well, and how do the politicians apply those laws? So I wonder, I guess, in the North Korean example, do they use that sometimes to get their way politically? I'm not sure. There's no real evidence yeah, for um, against that. Yeah. Okay, okay. We have two more sources to cover for the section at least, minimum. If we got spare time, I can. I got some other quick rapid-fire stuff I can throw in. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, Sam, you mentioned the Rocky Road travel one as well. Is there any religion of Korea? Yeah, that was the one you could bring up next. This was another. That's one my intention. That's my intention. Correct. Um, what I'll read it out anyway. Um, what is many religions in North Korea? Official North Korea is an atheist state. However, according to most recent estimations, some religions do exist. There are Korean religions of shame, shamanism, and Sean Don Sean. Taoism, as well as Christianity and Buddhism. The North Korean constitution officially guarantees freedom of religion, but in reality, it's uh, but the reality is this reality. This is not the case. The DPRK was born out of Marxist principles, 
So the Muslims self based on North Korean socialism are strongly opposed and incompatible to with his beliefs. North Korean um North Koreans are commonly taught from early age about dangers and negative effects of religion, but continue to practice religions underground regardless of dan- dangers involved. That's what the Rocky Road one said in its initial thing. I don't I don't actually disagree with that. I mean, I've talked to people from China, for instance, and the fact of the matter is, I understand the DPRK is moving away a little bit from Marxism, not that much. It's still a socialist state, but essentially, Juche is um, Kim Il Sung putting his own spin on Marxism and Leninism, to put it lightly. I'm not going to go into full on analysis of Juche, but the fact of the matter is that in China, they actually do teach evolution in school. Um, they teach feminism. They're really liberal and progressive, a lot of these um, countries nowadays that, um, that espouse Marxism and Leninism. So I'm not exactly surprised that, yeah, there is freedom of religion, but in practice, they're only really teaching um, secular principles in practice. And I'm not exactly sure. Okay, this is my second point. An atheist state, I'm not sure it is state atheist. Um, I think it's state secularist. And that's a really small, it's almost a mystic, actually. But I do find it interesting that a lot of people in North Korea. I'm going to look up. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to. I'm going to look up one thing specifically. Keep talking anyway. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting thing um, in North Korea because a lot of apparently, according to Wikipedia, this is just a summary glance of their comp- of their composition in terms of religious belief. You find that there's more people who are state agnostic as opposed to state atheists. And I find that to be a really interesting distinction because in a traditionalist society such as North Korea, a very conservative society, agnosticism would probably be the leading religion, uh, for lack of a better word, the leading belief or non-belief agnosticism because a lot of traditional values that were part of the traditional religion is also included within their culture. Um... Actually, honestly, can I please go next? I, 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 yes, you're going next anyway because I want to ask you one specific, one specific question. Um, does the Queen Workers Party need their members to be atheist or not? Um, if 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 not, that's fine. I'm just, I just need to know for this clarification for my next argument. Uh, no, it's. It's not a matter of not not everyone has to be an atheist. It's not an enforced thing that they have to enforce. But then, uh, um, um, just say no. Just say no. Then, yep. no, continue. Also, continue your point. My point is that when he said they're a conservative society, actually, the GPRK is more progressive than South Korea is. However, in relation to race mixing, for example, and the ideology of but to clarify, the DPRK ambassador has an African has an, Af- an African king who a king who is actually half black. The all racial purification things that exist in South Korea are they are very very conservative in South Korea. More so, the DPRK is way more open to people of other ethnicities and races. They are not actually very conservative in any way, in most ways. They're actually incredibly progressive. However, their Korean culture is quite mono-ethnic, but they are a lot more progressive in North Korea than South Korea, where there is still, I would say, a more progressive or even fascistic viewpoints of blood and soil, which do support South Korean racial purity, and racial purity is more intense and put into South Korean society in the Korean Republic than the GPRK. I want to clarify on that one. Okay, 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 enough. Enough now. Um, okay, the reason why I was asking about the clarification about uh, members need to be atheists is because, for example, right, uh, this, this, this is related to a, po- a point Mike made about, say, atheism. Um, for example, Within the Communist Party of China, for example, it is still a requirement that you have the atheist to join. Okay. For example, and that was from, from the very beginning to now. Um, that's why I said that it's a clear thing. And am I saying China's atheist? 
either. No, I I still say I still say China is state secularist, but the point is is that these sort of distinctions do matter because because yes, I do agree. The whole line of argumentation about it being linked to say atheism, say atheism is. I agree, incorrect. Do you agree it's also incorrect, Mike? Uh, Sam, Sam? Yes, it is incorrect. It's a socialist state with a separation of church and state. It doesn't make it up yet. Uh, good, good. We now got, we, now good. We, uh, we all in agreement. The point here is, just simply put, that at the end of the day, the whole narrative about, say, atheism can occur if, for example, Something like the CPC having members needing to be atheists exists. But also, and this is the interesting part, is that even in this situation, it and the reason why I say China's not so atheist either is because it's one clarification. The, yeah. the CPC is the only party requiring that. No other party needs that. Mm. And also, I'd like to make another clarification that the Korean Workers' Party is not the only political party in the DPRK. There are some small other parties. One's a Japanese party, and the other one's a, another one's a, another is a Democratic Party. There's a small other party that exists there. There are two other smaller parties in the, in, in the DPRK, so it's not just the Korean Workers' Party. And my whole, I, my whole point here is to say that the whole thing about say atheism. Uh, okay, we've got ten minutes. We can f- get go for the final source. Okay, okay. Then on this topic, um, on this topic, given we're talking about socialist states, um, there's there was an interesting thing, uh, as Mike can see here, about uh, by the uh, by the Cornell Chronicle. Religion less opiate, more suppressant. Study sets. This is now linking now away from North Korea, more to general, general discussion. And a site interesting, it which is a quite interesting, which I will now highlight on my screen. Now read to you, so Sam can know on about. Religion shape political ideology in accordance with the deeply held identities, interests, and values of a of agentic people, people with social influence or agency, with multiple overlapping identities seeking meaning and be well being in the face of uncertainty and injustice. Yeah. People in socially disadvantaged groups, including women, racial minorities and low income people of who of many of whom are quite politically engaged, seek religion in high numbers, while white well to do men Citing previous research, this is because religion provides disadvantaged groups a source of compensation for lack of social status, he said. Actually, this structurally disadvantaged groups are drawn to the sense that there's something out more out there this world than than they face this put this, this than they face <laughs> so I'll say this again. Structurally disadvantaged groups are drawn to the sense that there's something more out there. In this world where they face this dis- disproportionate hardship and marginalization. And something to and something to add into this is that Sam, stop it. Uh uh uh, mute, uh mute yourself if you're gonna make sound okay. Sorry, okay, sorry. Okay. Um another th- another factor about this is that even if Oh yeah, that's the thing. In fact, this is that even in slavery, religion was used as a way to suppress their way their their liberation. Mike, you might go. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I'll go ahead. Uh, I think um, it's true to some extent in in regards to the idea of. Um, Marx's original claim that religion is the opium of the masses because they're looking for something other than this world. And does that claim remain true today that it's used as an instrument of suppression? Um, it's both in the case of slavery. 
Um, and Italy in the south, they definitely, of course, America was always a religious society from its foundation, not so much nowadays. So there are people on both sides, of, both sides of the coin, essentially. Um, but I feel what's really important when you're sort of reading the law, they base a lot of their views on the Bible because America, Christianity in America is very protestant, so sola scriptura. And I feel in some way they were looking to just, they were kind of sort of twisting the, cl- the claim of the good book to support their worldview. They were looking for evidence in particular. So they were kind of very selective with what they were doing. They were using like particular lines to justify their position on slavery. And the truth of the matter is that on the most part, the Bible was anti-slavery in regards to the Jews um, and their exodus from Egypt. But in terms of the oppression of black people, they definitely mixed and matched their approach to that question. Um, I'm, 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 I'm Mike's off a second. Um, uh, one thing I found really good, though, in this, which, which I found, which I, which actually proves Marxism in this, is that in in this thing it says, he found that is consistent with Marx's claims that religion pr- provide provides psychological co- compensation, but in contrast, but in contrast with Marx's assertion, uh, da, 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 found that that applies more to groups of less social status rather than groups of less wealth, which actually does kind of concede the point to Marx, doesn't it? Um, and for this, for this, uh, Sam. Well. Points being the fact that when you look at the establishment of religion in relation to the family and religion in relation to the state, objectively it is used as a form of slavery and patronage against women to continually carry on the existence of private property and wealth. The church actually had played a role mostly in essentially in the feudalist period and others of essentially making sure that it protected private property and wealth. Religion was also used to actually impugn slavery of women and also the ideology of the male male patriarchy. Because have you noticed in the Holy Division, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there is no woman. The woman is removed from the equation completely. And women's roles in society are expunged by the church, who put women into a place of servitude, which is actually, even in the Bible, it even says men must, women must be submissive to men and submit to their will. It's actually used by most right wingers, including Americans, Europeans. And even most fascists who actually do not see a separation of church and state and do use Christianity as an excuse to justify the ideology of a fascistic or fascist state with no separation of powers. Look, there's a lot of things you've said. Um, I'll have to respond to them individually, but I guess one thing is that about the state, in terms of religion, look, I mean, Christianity has only been around the past 2,000 years, but I find it interesting within the Bible, I mean, if you take it as gospel, pun intended, the history of mankind and even within the bible okay i mean even from the book of genesis right women as you say they're a bit of a subservient position but then in modern history there is equality under the law because the law of moses it is treating people equally and nowadays we do have equality under the law so for most of human history what you're saying has it been essentially anti-egalitarian yes it has and nowadays in the modern era, history has become egalitarian. But what makes religion and the Christian faith in particular so compatible with Marxism, for lack of a better word, what makes them, I guess, corresponding is the fact that they both have a theory of history. And the theory of history in both Marxism and Christianity is very similar. They're essentially both apocalyptic faith. They both start at the beginning of human history. The, the one thing that is different between Marxism and Christianity is the theme. So in Marxism, the theme is class struggle throughout human history. But in turn, and in Christianity, the issue is struggle with sin in particular, with bad things in general. But how they both are apocalyptic faith 
to me personally is the fact that they both have an end to history. So how do you define an end of history? So in Christianity, the end of history is when the earth is essentially consumed by fire, and then we experience the afterlife in two different ways, as we've spoken about in the previous video. We either experience the afterlife in heaven or hell. But the end of history in communism is the end of class society. So there is a difference between the two, but they are really similar in form, if not in essence. And you can see how Marx, being a former Christian, would have taken that stylized form and bring it into his own. Mike, 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 Mike uh, that Sam was born, there's, there's like a minute left. Okay. Well, the ideology of religion was good, and the ideology of religion not to downplay the fact that people have a right to their faith, but however, the ideology of religion was imposed on people, against, was used by colonialism to impose it against people's will. For example, Australian Aboriginals never had Christianity. Native people of Africa never had Christianity, Maori people and Native American people in the in the in most of Latin America never did until the uh, the church imposed Christianity on them against their will and enforced uh, pretty much a racially based hierarchy that was but made on one hand with a gun in one hand, a cross in another and a Bible, mostly done by the Spanish and British Dutch. At the end of the day, when you look at religion and the ideology of what it does, its role in society, it never played a productive role in when it actually developed. At the period when Marx and Engels, when they write The Origins of Family, Private Property and the State, looking at the role of religion, Marxism views religion and says that religion played a role, yes, in feudalist times and society, but it also played a digressive role with the development of private property in the state. Essentially, its role was the suppression of the masses to private property and, su and suppression of people to religion. When religion became essentially the main power that owned the majority of the land and suppressed peasantry people until and created a theocracy. It also was used for the repression of women to subservience under a capitalist system. And actually, the Bible actually even was used because if you look at the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? I was I went to a Catholic boys' school for a while, right? And uh, oh, I, and then I saw the light, and I became a born again atheist. I did really after that. I became a born again atheist. I <laughs> uh yes, 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 again actually, but born again atheist would be. Isn't that the wrong way to look at it? Because isn't the best better way to look at it in the term of in terms of returning to a natural state of things, which is uh which is ultimately you're born atheist and you acquire religion. So just going back to the nature of things rather. <laughs> well, I was using it as a piss tag, but anyway. Yes, yes, and I know. Yes, yes. Uh anyway, um, Anyway, though, uh, in terms of the burden of proof, which I was going to cover, now we can cover, then, yeah. um, how do you see the burden of proof on claims? And and before that, and one, and two, do you know what the Sagan stand, the S -A, the Sagan standard is? Sagan. What's a Sagan? Uh, it's, it's, it, it's a standard when about claims from Carl Sagan. Never heard of him. Anyway, Carl Sagan said, uh, Carl Sagan is the person who said, extraordinary claims are quite extraordinary evidence. Yes. Do you, do you adhere to a standard? Of course. Cool. Okay, next. Next. Which one first? Which one first? Which one first? 
Okay. Then, uh, then in terms of the burden of proof when talking about theism or atheism, who do you think has burden of proof to back up claims? Well, I mean, the burden of proof lies in the historical retrospective and the reality of the world around us. The ideology of Marxism proves that reality is absolute and that there are always absolutes. The absolute burden of proof is in the way that communism is structured and how religion is done. We aren't necessarily talking about communism anymore necessarily. We're talking about general general atheism slash theism specifically. Well, well um, I'm saying that theism and atheism essentially the proof is based in how objectively or unobjectively you can look at something. You can look at something which is an absolute reality and it's objective or subjective. So theism Theism takes a subjective viewpoint, not an objective viewpoint. It rejects the notion of reality and replaces it with its own version of it in order to suit its own narrative. Okay, cool. Oh, good, 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 good. So, uh, oh, good, good, good. So, Dan, would you agree with with a comment from March first, twenty eighteen, from what's the name? from this publication who which says scientists claims claim uh scientists don't claim to know all the answers about the universe begin or how how the universe begun but the founders of Abrahamic religions and their fellows do claim to have all the answers thus the burden of proof should be upon the people who make those god creation claims Ele- um oh. Absolutely not. No, you've had not. You've had total nutters like the Vatican and the others, who have tried to imprison people like Galileo and people who said the world was round, and then they were put in jail and in prison for backing up claims that were essentially showing the the nature of reality, such as Darwinism, that Galileo the... and the others. Okay. Uh, continuing. Uh. Alec, but Alec, but quotes Norman Mailer as saying that religion should not be about answers, but about but about questions. However, religion is just about answers and not about questions. And just because a believer believes in the supernatural power does not mean that he or she does not owe a scientific explanation to be taken seriously. Do so. Uh, so, as a statement, do you agree or disagree with that statement? I would disagree with that statement. So, I think you have to be given the burden of proof that what you believe in is absolute because if a church won't give you those answers, then obviously they won't allow critical thinking of their policies, then that's actually proven that the church and the Vatican don't have all the answers. Science has the answers. Okay, okay, okay. One clarity here. Just to make it balanced. Okay. When I say scientists don't claim to know all the answers, that is still technically true. Because that is something which science itself does not claim to have. Science is not an absolute truthism itself. And that's what it's more referring to. The pursuit, oh. of, the, the pursuit of science itself is about finding out truth, yes. But is it a is yes. it, but is it a absolute truth claim? No, and that's what the whole point is. I agree with that. I mean, sometimes you can have claims, and then they can be disclaimed later on when new evidence comes up. It's it, like the religious not cast as a side. The earth is only two hundred years old. When there's Aboriginal people have been here for 60,000 years, yet these religious nutters claim the Earth is only 200 years old, but humans coexisted with dinosaurs. You know, you can take religion to any kind of wacko theory you want. Okay, uh, okay, okay. In this case, then, uh, in this case, then, in this case, then, uh, remember the Econ standard, um, and I want you to, and I want you to apply it to the next few sources. And these are and these are theistic sources. 
which is interesting. Yeah. Is this more of a test? It seems to be interesting. Okay. One. Cold case Christianity, which is a apologist thing. Uh, mm -hmm. These are now going to be apologists. Because this would be interesting to see how you deal with, deal with these claims. Yeah. As an atheist, I really found it necessary to defend my position when I when talking about when talking with friends who believe in the existence of God. After all, my Christian friends were the ones who making claim about invisible beings, certainly not the burden of proof belonged to them rather than me. I simply held the default position there's no need to defend the absence of something that appears to be absent. From my perspective, theists alone were the ones who needed to make my a case. My position as an atheist was self evident. This approach was always put was 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 always put Christian friends in a defensive position. They found themselves struggling to assemble the evidence while I, always, while I simply criticized the validity of each piece of their case. I never started to think that I might be, that I might also need to make a case for what I believed, and my Christian friends were unable to demonstrate my, my, my responsibility to do so. Okay. First things first. First things first. If you are fierce or atheist, you still need your reasons to be theist or atheist. So, first things first, this project is starting off on a really bad note by poisoning the water. Do you agree with that? I would say that's pretty much the burden of truth on theism is the fact that you should... Actually, you got, you got the burden of proof, which is the, uh, the material reality of how of, of, of the conditions maybe of your upbringing, perhaps, or the society you live in that might bring you to that conclusion. However, that conclusion can be also disconcluded. Okay. Um, let's continue. Um, this isn't that long. I can continue then. Today, yeah. as, today as a Christian who has been involved in the examination of evidence for the past 25 years, I understand that atheists also have been the proof. All of yes. us intending to explain the world around us move from plethora of questions to simple responsibility. And this is where, mm -hmm. look, I understand where he's coming from, but mm -hmm. no, but I also disagree. The thing mm -hmm. is, the thing is, using second standards here, who has a, most, who has a more extraordinary claim here? The, uh, which of the two claims, then, is the question? Which of the two claims is the extraordinary one? Is it the, is the claim that a, is a, is a claim that a god or supernatural deity exists the, the extraordinary claim? Or is the claim that no god or supernatural deity exists the extraordinary claim? I think this is where it could be, it could be weaponized by both, necessarily, in this situation. Do you agree? Yeah. I would agree with that. I think that uh, if you look at Richard Dawkins, for example, uh, theism and Richard Dawkins would be the most uh, extreme case of uh, theism that came from Richard Dawkins' perspective of atheism and he's a physicist and his viewpoints. Oh, man, have you looked at that guy? He is off the planet, eh? To, to, be, to be honest... I don't really read atheist content so much because because for me I just became atheist naturally so I and I never had that cycle of reading through atheist content before being atheist <laughs> so I don't really well, understand I, I, I went through the same experience when I was about 13 14 I got expelled from high school I was in a Catholic or boys school and I went to the autistic center I met a guy who said he was an atheist and I agreed with his viewpoints and adopted it as a viewpoint and it wasn't just a rebellion against the society I lived in and essentially proved that at the end of the day well material conditions of how I never really had religion in my family anyway. We were raised secular and we never had religion. It was just that like a special education unit there. And to be honest with you, that really just made me just see, you know, religion can just go fuck off, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's fine. It's like Billy Conley's jokes about the Jehovah's Witnesses. It was fucking hilarious. <laughs> True. Okay, next one. Uh, basically, he went on a little more. 
but it's mostly irrelevant. Mostly irrelevant stuff. He just, uh, he just he he just basically makes an advocacy for shared responsibility, which I'll just I, I guess I'll cover that one from you on. Both groups share a common burden of proof. If fees are to deposit are to deposit God as the answer to some or all of the questions I've described, we are going to have to argue for existence of activity of personal be divine being. If if it's going to argue the and the ad uh the adequate answers exist without a need for God, they need they are to at least have going to have to provide sufficient impersonal naturalistic. Explanations. In either case, both groups, if they are honest with themselves, ha will have to shoulder the burden of burden of burden of proving their case. The burden of, of proof is not limited to the to the theist. All of us needs to make a case for our own choices and causes. One side defends supernaturalism; the other defends philosophical nationalism. One side argues for personal supernatural cause; the other for purely impersonal naturalistic cause. Hmm. What's well, a purest nationalistic cause, really? Uh, so I uh, sorry, uh, impersonal naturalistic. Oh, okay, yeah. So the ideology that there's a divine being on the seventh day, God made the world, and on Sunday he rested. Blah blah blah. That stuff. Yes. Well, I mean, when the evidence is there to show that the Big Bang theory happened. The evolution of human society and the evolution that Darwin used scientifically proves the point that human evolution and is real. The ideology of creationism has been misproven time and time and time again by science that has disproven creationism is bollocks. Essentially, you can't sit there and argue with the proof of evidence that the evolution of human society and evolution in nature with Darwin's theories were incorrect when the science has proven it. If you look at Australia, for example, Charles Darwin came here and he probably looked at planet horses and animals here and thought, what the fuck? If God exists, he must be on acid. What kind of fucked up shit is this, you reckon? <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway. Um, anyway. <laughs> anyway. Let's not linger. Uh, next one. Uh, Catholic answers. This is a uh, this, this 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 is a attempt to address some of Catholic answers. I'm gonna love this one. <laughs> Break on. Uh, and what is Catholic answers again? Let me just find out for you so I can do that. Catholic answers is a database of answers about the belief or practices of the Catholic faith. <laughs> Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. Day 86. Challenge. The burden of proof is on those who believe in God. Atheists don't have to prove God doesn't exist. Believers have to prove he does. Okay. Um, first things first. First, yes. first things first. How would you answer that? Just that statement. Well, having to prove that God exists... You're trying to essentially argue that there has to be proof of God. Well, how do you prove the existence of something that doesn't exist, for one thing? When the burden of proof on people to prove a point and then to show that it does or does not exist, essentially you can't, uh, the Catholics can't argue for the existence of God above all others and then reject the notion of the reality of the science that proves that it's not the case. Uh, okay, okay, but the thing is, though, even going further than this, there's a bigger key issue with proving God, and that is which God, which version of God, which nature of God, because... Yeah, Yahweh, Allah, whatever you want to call it, and that's not that's not where the loophole starts. That's not where the rabbit hole starts. It then extends to much greater issues, such as the issues surrounding even like if God is of a different nature than what your mainstream is. How do you then prove which God's nature is true? <laughs> 
Is he a vengeful or spiteful God or is he a God of compassion? Exactly. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, let's just get on to the point uh, of, yeah. what, of what the Catholic answers said. Um, the, the, okay. the, the misunderstandings of the burden of proof. The concept, of from, the concept is borrowed from civil law where it refers to a obligation a party has to provide sufficient evidence for a claim or lose his case. U.S. law establishes the presumption of innocence according to which, which prosecutor must prove the accused is guilty of a offence or accuses will, or accused will be acquitted and be legally treated as innocent. The presumption of innocence is a choice our society has made to favour the accused, lest prosecutors use power of the state to falsify him False, falsely convict large numbers of innocent people and bring about a win of terror. However, the burden of proof works differently in a setting such as philosophical or religious or discussions. From a logical point of view, it doesn't matter whether one is arguing for a proposition P or a denial not P. It's in the absence of evidence. Neither oh. it is more it is it is more probable than the other. Consequently, as long as things remain in the abstract, people nobody has the burden of proof. Uh, the burden of the burden is created when one person brings a certain P or not P if he wants to convict a per, convince a person of proposition or his or his denial. Then he needs to offer that person reasons why mm -hmm. the physical burden of proof it thus does not intrinsically fall on either party. It is something that you assume when you try to convict convince someone of someone else of a position. All of this applies to, to situations where one is making a claim about whether something exists until you consider the evidence. Neither the proposition X exists or the proposition X does not exist can be deemed more probable than other than the than the other. And doesn't matter what X is, as long as you have no evidence favoring the existence or non-existence of X, both presumptions are equally probable. Thus, yeah. if if a theist wants to convince a non-theist that God exists, he needs to provide arguments for opposition. And if an atheist yeah. wants to convince a non-atheist that God does not exist, he he simply needs to offer arguments for opposition. The burden of proof is assumed by whoever is trying to convince the other. I would say that's true. I mean, when you when you look at the ideology of contradictions, when we're lucky we live in a secular society, unlike Poland or one of those fucking shit old countries like Russia or well, like sorry, not Russia, Poland or sorry, you know, countries where there are. No separation of church and state, which essentially. I think though, I I think though the biggest issue with this is that if we're saying rational, where we can both testify to it existing, at least in a way you can testify to existence. This can apply as a genuine methodology, fine, but the issue is with 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 theism and God, is this. Often. Most of the claims that defend God's existence basically have him as non-existent. <laughs> and that is kind of an issue. Yeah, you're uh, kind of contradicting yourself there, aren't you? If, uh, for, for example, right, if we cannot even prove, because this is this is where, again, as I, as I said, um, okay intention bad example because it's like you need to actually be able to provide some form of evidence for it that can exist and can link to something for mm. example a wager wait let's just do a wager okay. um for example a wager of miracles let's let's just go on that example what i would consider mm. a wager of miracles is if I could smell again in the full function out of nowhere. Uh, no chance. You've got this condition, you're fucked. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. 
the same it, way. It'd be, it'd be the same I, way. I, I'm, I'm, it'd be like they'd be like the same. They'd be like saying tomorrow. Uh, so, um, I'll Sam, 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 and that's what that's what to say. For example, that would be a burden or or action which is beyond human means. If yes. God does truly exist and has omnipresence and power that, that is supposed to him, he can cure it. Yep, if God exists, I want him to cure my autism. If he doesn't, well, fuck him, he doesn't exist. And all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, for example, that would be a good way of convincing. Because <laughs> it would be, wouldn't it? I because, because, <laughs> a bit, because thing is, especially especially for God claims that is apparently the creator of the universe claims. Yeah, and the thing that like Jesus cured lepers and did all this miracle bullshit, water into wine, all this bullshit. I, 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 and that, and that's the thing. We we should always apply that degree of angle towards it to actually have the claims of God's existence. If they claim supernatural cause, to actually have a supernatural response. Well, it was that Billy Conley movie, the man who sued God when his boat got struck by lightning, and the and the old, and the insurance company said it was covered by act of God. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Next source. I don't know if I don't know the yeah. origin of this one, but I just found it on, on online somewhere, which is and it's interesting enough. Philosophy of yep. religion, section eight, arguments for miracles. That's why I'm mentioning mentioning this. Burden of proof. Yep. Burden of proof. Let's bring this up for everyone else. Yes. Uh, I know you can't see, but I'm bringing <laughs> my screen. My screen. You can look at it later if you want. Um, uh -oh. from X, which is assertion, it is not yet disproved. Therefore. This is a fallacy. X is unproven and remains unproven. Examples. One, mm. of, of, yeah. of course God exists. Has there one proven otherwise? Two, of course big elephants inhabit, inhabit Mars. We don't see them because they blend in. Can you prove otherwise? Three, of course Santa Claus does it. Of course, of, of course Santa Claus exists. No one has, has ever proven to my knowledge that Santa Claus does not exist. And if anyone, if, and if one were to fly to the to the North Pole and say, well, right. look, there's no toy factory there. A believer could argue, well, Santa Claus knew you were coming and moved to the poison South Pole, so you don't... So you, so you fly down South Pole, no Santa Claus toy factory there, so you say, oh, we're going to move back to North Pole. Four. Of course, left corners exist. <laughs> nice argument. <laughs> let's let's keep let's keep some focus, see. Eh? Uh, I'm just trying to not laugh my fucking head off, and that's like a fucking the best atheist argument. It's like arguing for the existence of God. It's like almost like when I set up the Trotskyites, believing that Santa Claus exists and finding out he doesn't exist. Sam, 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 let's keep focus. Four, of course, leprechauns exist. Has anyone proven otherwise? Five, of course, God exists. Has 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 anyone proven otherwise? Six, of course, yellow, uh, yellow podka dotted aliens exist. Has has anyone proven otherwise? On this point, there about aliens, I do think aliens have much more, much more of a plausibility factor to exist than God, because because of the simple fact of the universe. So, aliens yeah. existing, plausible. <laughs> I'm saying that right now. And I mean, the Gaelic legends about, oh, leprechauns and the fact that they're, they're just Gaelic folklore. There's no actual substantial evidence that in Ireland they ever found the remains of leprechauns. It was just an Irish folk legend about, uh, you know, a benevolent little bastard who lived at the end of the rainbow as a cobbler and it actually does that. But at the end of the day, the whole leprechaun at the end of the rainbow thing was an Irish folklore, which was essentially just like a fairy tale that was an Irish folk Celtic folklore. Okay, okay. Let's keep focusing. Seven. Of course, exorcist. Has anyone proven otherwise? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Proof of negative claims. So you simply cannot 
prove general claims that are negative claims. One cannot prove that ghosts do not exist. One cannot prove that leprechauns do not exist. One cannot simply prove a general claim. Negative statements often make up claims that are hard to prove because they make predictions about things which we, which we are in practice unable to observe in finite time. For, infinite, for instance, there are no big green Martians, means there are no big green Martians in this or any universe. And unlike your bathtub, it is not possible to look at it in every corner of the universe. Thus, we cannot completely test this proposition. I think that's fair to say. I mean, about 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 the testing yeah. of, of at least the inability to, to test test proposition itself. If that's fair to say. And I would say the theory about ghosts actually. I think ghosts do exist. My father saw one when he was in New Guinea. He was all. Uh, and actually, he was all in there, and he, he was over in PNG, and he actually saw one when he was over there because the place he was in was built on a Lahirian burial ground in New Guinea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll, I'll report, report what he, he said, that the room got very cold, and this was weird because it's Papua New Guinea. It's as hot as hell because it's on the equator, right? Sure. And every time, every time the dog was on the veranda, they would hear footsteps on the veranda. However, all the cabins were locked out at night. There was no way anyone could go on the veranda. They would hear footsteps outside. Mm -hmm. He looked in the corner of his room, and there was a purple apparition of a New Guinea man wrapped in a death shroud, crouched in the middle of the corner. Okay. So the. The thing of ghosts is, I think I had one visit me once. It sat on the end of my bed, and I could kind of feel the bed get heavier. So I actually had kind of think that there is evidence of the, of the supernatural, but that does exist. However, uh... um, on that point, uh, on that point though, I don't know, but at the same time, I don't know due to other reasons because I do get paranoia from time to time. So I don't know if, if it's my brain tricking me or not <laughs> in general in some things. So yeah, I don't I don't know simply due to the fact that I I am prone to getting paranoia. So <laughs> well, the house at Gumbo we lived in had some weird things happen there when I was there as well. And my dad said he felt the same way when he was over there. And we. And anyway, the reason we say I don't know due to paranoia is because, as you know, if you actually get paranoia from time to time, paranoia, oh, yeah. paranoia makes you question everything. You cannot trust anything with paranoia when you have it. Yeah. Uh, when I get stoned, I never get paranoid when I'm stoned, but I'll tell you what, some people get stoned, they get paranoid. As... Anyway, as, as, um, in my in my case though, I don't I, I rarely drink. I don't I don't smoke, and and I still just get it. I think I think it's just due to, I just think it's due to years of mental health issues that I get it. <laughs> yeah, it actually helps my mental health issues. But anyway, I'll continue. Yeah, regardless, we aren't talking about mental health or paranoia right now. I'm just saying. I am just saying that as a point, just to say that something might happen, something might might not happen. I don't know. Yeah. Okay, is it uh, okay? Where was I at? We just can't look around us within the limits of our ability and desire to expand, expend time with us on on looking, and prove that where we have looked so far within the limits of our knowledge, anything can anything at all. There's no big green margin in this case. We can provide negative, not to say negative, like of the sweeping proposition in question. On, on this though is that especially about time and looking in and we and resources into looking into things i would say honestly that there's no point trying to look into into the existence of god anyway it's like i mean i think i think when we look at it from a white anglo-saxon perspective then you would look at it from the perspective of say aboriginal people and uh Native cultures where there are different kinds of benevolent spirits that do exist, and there are certain places which they're told not to go to due to the existence of, of spirits that actually are in there, which may be good or bad spirits where they're told not to go to certain areas at night. Some areas are no go zone, some areas they can go to, which actually do have 
you know, nice dream time stories and myths about the supernatural which exist in the Indigenous communities, like Native Americans, Aboriginals, New Guinea people and others. Anyway, so, um, anyway, as I was saying, though, we, my, my clarification is this. Because our life, because our life <coughs> is so limited in terms of time yeah. scale, yeah. there's no point searching for God because we only have, at, at most around a hundred years to live and 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 in, in that time frame it's better to focus on other things rather than searching for god in which you cannot prove exists <laughs> that's what i'm saying it's so weird that people do that they go to the himalayas they go to india they go to fucking you know tibet they go to these countries and, you know, they go to look to start, find, you know, this spiritual guru somewhere and sit on the top of a mountain and believe that they meditate, they'll find God. Mm -hmm. It kind of comes into this weird thing how people try to find something. It's like trying to chase something that doesn't exist. Okay, cool. Uh, okay. Uh, we're, taking, we're taking bad and proof. This is a little bit down. Okay. Yeah. There are those who refuse to accept the burden of proof rests with those making positive claims. They, yeah. do, they do not what they do. They do not want to claim that miracles exist unless someone proves they do not exist. Soul souls exist unless someone proves they do not exist. Angels angels exist unless someone proves they do not exist. Deities exist unless someone proves they don't exist. Those who have behaved in this manner are taking were taking use of reason. If they want to believe X is true because X exists and to believe it without evidence or even against evidence or the contr of the contrary, they want to have their beliefs remain intact and not subject to to re refutation and re-examination for fear of needing to alter their beliefs. They rest, they rest their beliefs on X existing in X true, X true not being on evidence and reason but on faith. And even on blind mm. faith, and when against reason and counter evidence, unwillingly blind faith, such behavior is within the realm of religion and not at all acceptable amongst those who who would pursue philosophical discourse and would ask them for ask ask that reason and evidence support claims. Yeah, I mean, I can see that maybe even if someone was to go from being a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew to being an atheist, right? Okay, maybe at one point they go to the synagogue, the church, the mosque, and then if they have faith in God, then I don't know, if their father dies of cancer or, you know, something horrible happens, right? All of a sudden there's a conundrum. There is when they are faced with the reality of blind faith now just gets smacked and kicked in the balls, right? It does essentially. And then they may question their faith and then abandon their faith in the in the uh, in the uh, face of the reality of the world around them and the grief of the loss of a loved one and the ideology of the, of the benevolent all caring, almighty, compassionate God taking someone away from them, then they're going to go, well, fuck him, you reckon? Okay. Uh, this is good, actually. Uh, ne next section. It goes, this is a bit up from there, but it's still relevant. The unprovability of non-existence. Here's what the objective, objective newsletter has to say about logical fallacies, providing negative. Uh, providing the non-existence of, of that <laughs> for which has no evidence of any kind exists. Proof, logic, reason, thinking, Knowledge pertain and to, to deal with only with what exists. They cannot be applied to what does not exist. Nothing can be relevant or apply, applicable to those to the non existence. Non, non existent, sorry. The non existent is nothing. An, a positive statement based on facts and have been erroneously inter interpreted can be refuted by, by means of ex exposing the errors of the interpretation of the facts such as, such as in the in the disproving of a positive not being a negative rational demonstration is necessary to support even the claim that a thing is possible it is a breach of logic to assert that something that which has been proven to be impossible is 
therefore possible. Um, and an absent okay. status not confit, con, uh, constitute proof of anything. Nothing can be derived from nothing. If I say anything is possible, I must admit the possibility that that the statement is, I mean, is false. Of course, there are some things that are that are absolutes. For example, water will always freeze; it will always boil. The sun will rise; the sun will set. These are total absolutes, and you know these absolutes will never change because they are total absolutes. And you can't say anything is possible because what is determined by nature and reality is absolute. You can't say that. So these things will change one day and water will run uphill, not downhill, and that, you know, essentially, you know, like you're essentially trying to say that God exists and that things can... And anyway, the, re the reason why I mentioned Carl Sagan earlier is because it says mention of him here. Absence of evidence is not evidence of the absence. Carl Sagan criticized such, such impatience with ambiguity. In cause uh yeah 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 yada yada we can read that shit later. Um it means that if we don't have if if it means if you don't know that something exists and have no evidence that it exists, then that is not sufficient basis for thinking that we have proven it does not exist at all. It only it it only means we don't know one way or another. We just haven't been made aware of it yet, so it's not part of our knowledge. Another, this is another variation of argument ad ignor, ignorum, uh, which is basically argument of, of ignorance, out of out of ignorance or personal ignorance. I know ignorum. I learned I learned a little Latin. Yeah. Um, I know Latin as well because I because I studied Latin, but I'm just saying what ignorum translates to in English. Argument ad ah yeah. uh, 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 sorry, I'll say it properly. I uh I'll say probably Agrapetalum at it at at Igratalum. I said it incorrectly, but I don't care. <laughs> People can see it on the screen. Um Agadoros da Ignatorum. Uh Ag uh Agratalum at uh ad Ignatolum. There you go. Yeah. Got it correct now. I got it, yeah. Um an argument out of personal ignorance, basically. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, the ideology of ignorance. I mean, you can say, when, say, let's see, when you've got the ideology of the existence of God, say you had, I don't know, a missionary who goes somewhere to, I don't know, from, I don't know, some fucking wanker Christian who goes to another country, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they rock, and they rock up at that country, and they meet the native people, and the native people explain their religion and their spiritual system to them, and they say that's all wrong, you're all wrong, 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 and then you've got to convince these native people that Jesus Christ and God exist and to embrace it, and they're going to look at you and go. Well, at least we worship the sun. The sun is real. The earth is real. The water is real. Where's the existence of your fucking God? He's not real. We can't see him. We can see the sun and we can mm. see the existence of nature. You can't really argue against the indigenous people's argument, can you? Let's continue. The source of fantasy is the assumption that someone is true, so that something is true unless proven otherwise or that is false unless proven otherwise. <laughs> From a lack of knowledge or lack of evidence to support a claim, it is not appropriate and definitely not safe to reach any definite conclusions about the claim. Um, yeah. the, the case of the case of evidence of absence depends upon whether or not any kind exists. If none exists, then absence of evidence is neither evidence or absence of a, or of existence. If someone yeah. claims that X exists, then then it is just for X. But the more people look into the place where X is ought to be. In ways and look at times, then X should like more likely to be there. Uh, yeah. the, and there is no evidence of X found. Then, yeah. then the more confidence you have, say there is no X. Even the absence of evidence, we uh, really is evidence of 
even the absence of, ev of evidence really is evidence of, of absence in the few well-defined cases of, of finite extension, e.g. there was no elephant in the desk of the drawer because there was no absence of evidence of the elephant being in a desk drawer. Ignorance of evidence is neither one of these things that shouldn't be mistaken to apply one e uh, to imply mm -hmm. either one. Ign ignorance of evidence is evidence of ignorance that is and that is all. <laughs> Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. That's basically a lot of. That's basically all of the stuff I was going to cover yeah. anyway. Yeah. So the rest of it, on the rest of it, if you want to continue, is free form. Okay. Fair enough. So, so far, the arguments seem very interesting. Most of the stuff you've researched, the garden hours, it's, it's very interesting, actually. I mean, the arguments that we use as atheists, pretty much, I mean, I've always, I'm an atheist, but I always consider myself a secularist, too. I mean, when I would talk to my friend who's a Muslim about this, I would talk to her about the secular nature of society. And so, well, if you look at how uh, well, the Aztec and Mayan cultures and the beliefs in nature, if I had a more corroboratively intelligent argument, then there's some mythical sky daddy who waves his hands around and makes things happen, you reckon? Uh, sure. And honestly, uh, say a, say a ending note, then I will finish the recording, because that's enough covered. <laughs> Uh, so Sam, what's your final note you want to end it with? Well, I'd like to end it on the note that I think that when we are talking to people about religion and feminism, we have to go and approach things from an objective viewpoint. We have to have to use rationale and logic to approach things. We cannot approach things with the sheer dogma, which is uh. Unfortunately, atheists do have a tendency to use dogma, and theism is dogma. And this dogma is unproductive when trying to talk to people and find points of commonality with people who have religion in relation to our views on socialism and other issues. So trying to convince people that being a communist doesn't mean you're a godless, a godless communist and an atheist and a godless communist. We 